Hello, everyone. Welcome to Miami Freedom Projects, a show with Miami Community Radio. We're very happy, excited to be here with Sol Ruiz. Um, she's here. She's going to be, um, has a very important project coming up, and I'm excited to talk to you about it. Well, welcome, Sol. We're so happy you're here with us. Hello, hello, my friends. Um, I wanted to just dive into what you're doing next, because I think there, you're someone who people have a lot of experience with. I think you're someone who feels very much like everybody in Miami feels like you belong to them, because you're, you've become such a voice for, for a Miami sound, a new Miami sound. Um, but your new project is something I'm really excited about. It's, it's going to be the Positive Vibration Nation. It's an opera that you're going to be performing at Miami Light Project. It's coming up very soon, April 12th through the 13th. Um, what, what makes you write an opera? What inspired you to, to direct your voice, your music, your sound to that form? So, uh, pretty simply, I lived in Italy 10 years, and I, I resonated a lot with the operas there that I wanted to go see. I love opera, traditional opera, obvious. Um, but then I, I also did an opera here in, in, in Los Angeles with a composer named Ted Hearn. And through that, I decided to tell this story through an opera because I like telling a story through music from the beginning to the end, and I think whether it's contemporary music or traditional music or any type of music, just telling the story through music, it, 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 it is my style. Mm -hmm. So I thought, why not do that? Because it, it suits me, you know? Can That's I ask it. you, so you said you, you studied in Italy. What, what, what is your favorite opera? What was your, your, your first experience of opera that made you fall in love with that form? Oh, wow. I saw Rigoletto in, um, in Napoli in the San Carlo, um, when a, a traditional mm -hmm. opera with no microphones and mm -hmm. the little pits, like I felt like I was in the 1700s. I cried so much. And, and that really moved me so much that I thought to myself, this is what I want to do. You know, and, and it's bizarre because I know that Miami Sound never has had an opera and the Rock Wawanko opera, I thought that it was too far off to pitch it, but then I, I thought, why, why not give it a shot? And then Miami Light Project picked it up and I said, and Knight Foundation supported it and a lot of people started supporting and I said, hey, you know what? There's something to this. <laughs> Do you have any experience, interest in, and I just thought of this now, and I don't know that I've thought of this form in a while, zarzuela? Like, do you have any experience or under, like, kind of, like, is it, does it evoke anything for you, or it's, it's Italian opera as a form, specifically that? Are you talking, zarzuela? The Spanish operas that we grew right, up with. Right, zarzuela, yeah. which is the, the Spanish versions. Yeah. So I do have, a, I did see in Madrid, um, one, I think Carmen is also one a uh, Zaranzuela, is it not? I, I mean it's French, and then it's I think it's it has been I, done in I'm a sure. Zaranzuela version. I'm I sure. Remember, I remember seeing one at some point, but uh, not. I don't remember the name, but I seen so many shows over there. But I I'm sure that I saw it and and I'm sure I loved it, but I don't remember which one. Yeah, no, it's just as you were talking about opera, I always feel like that should know. be more closer to me, but yet it feels further away than Italian opera, than what we think of in the United States, like how we engage with opera. It's very European. It's, 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 it's France, Italy, maybe Germany. But that's, those are the operas that we engage with, but we have a, clo a form that's closer to us that feels yes, we we're, do. Not, we're not close as, 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 as engaged with. Well, you know, I... The thing is that with traditional Italian opera, that's where the form of the, the song that we still use, chorus, verse, t telling a story through the three minutes, it's still from there. So I think that for me, and living there and absorbing that culture, that's where I got the, the vibe for that. Um, more than the Zarazuela, which I'm sure it has its own thing and its own vibe. Um, but I really got this, this kind of concept from the Italian one, which I love, you know, so that's what, that's what I felt in my heart, you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I just, I think it's, it's lovely, and until you said it, I also realized, do you, were you, when you do an album, do you think of it as a story from beginning to end? Yeah, I do, and I try to tie things together magically through little mm -hmm. subliminal things, 
Like, I don't know if anybody noticed that I, I, I end a lot of songs that they, in the time 305. I like a lot, there's a lot of subliminal things in my music that I, I, I'm not sure if people caught on to it yet or I'll, I'll let that happen naturally. But there's a lot of stuff like that in my music that I think, you know, it's just my little uh, madness clicks at the moment. But I love tying things together, tying little things together to my roots, to my people, to experiences in my life and doing it in a way that is subliminal or artistic that people have to interpret it for me is super fun. What was the <laughs> what was the most challenging part about writing the opera? Because you're you're also writing a story. There's a libretto, people are going to be following it as you're singing, as you're performing. What what was there any part that was more challenging for you? Well, telling a story for me that it comes so I, I authentically from my deep core, I think that that was I, I, I really wanted to bring that out. I don't know if it was the most difficult, but I think it was the it's the most revealing, and it, it really, I I and, and a lot of points in the show, it's gonna it's almost hard for me not to cry because there's so much much emotion in each thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the hardest thing about putting anything together is getting the people together and and uniting everybody, which was the goal of this show, um, I think is to create community, create unity. And uh, that was, the, the, the challenge was everybody's schedule, everybody's mm -hmm. timing, but I think the, the music part always comes the most natural to me. You've had this incredible experience being in Italy, living, being able to live that experience through this form that could feel very remote to other people. When you were bringing in your collaborators, how comfortable were, were, were they? How, how old or new was this to them? How did they engage with this material? Well, so uh, the characters are my bandmates. So that's Rey Rodriguez, uh, Alejandro Sierra, um, Charlie Poe. They, they have been working with me for 13 years. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it was difficult for them to understand that, hey, Soul is doing this and come on. Let's do this, especially since they they created the songs with me, a couple of the songs with me also. So I I feel like they right away understood where I was coming from, whereas um, then we have the directors, um, the director is Teo Castellano, and w once we w once I got the picture together with everybody, getting everybody on board to understand what this concept was. A lot of them would read the libretto and they're like, how are we gonna do that part? And um, it's come together so naturally and not it's not so literal as it is interpretation, you know? So I think a lot of people are gonna walk away and, and just t have a conversation about what mm -hmm. things meant, really. So I'm, I'm leaving that open. Well, how do you feel your audience that's gonna, that usually engages with you? Spotify through your music and in kind of more contemporary ways. Like, how do you, do you feel that the audience is going to be able to find you in an opera? Your your typical audience or what you think of as as the audience that that you've built. Do you think that they're going to be open to to an opera or that's going to be a new experience for them? Uh, I think it's I think it's along the lines of of what Sol and the Tribu has already been creating, and I think that. It's just an extension of me, and I think that it, it, it's, it, it is the Miami sound. It is uh, something that has already been something that people have been consuming just at, in, at, in a story form, so I'm not even worried. Nice. I think they're going to get it. <laughs> I think so, too. I think it's, it's going to be not worried. Um, <laughs> new Miami sounds. What is that new Miami sound for you? What defines it for you? So, uh, and for... For better terms, I just think that it's un, un picadillo, un sancocho. It's the the sound of Miami is a lot of Caribbean music mixed together, and with uh, the bass, Miami bass, and funk and swamp swampiness. But I think that all those elements that come together create a sound that is really unique, really special. And I'm getting chills just talking about it because. That's that's my sauce, you know. I love that sauce, and I want to represent that sauce for all of us. And I love I love to be a part of this town. 
So thank you guys for support. What, what for you, what makes it different? Because I feel that Miami is always referencing its influences. It's I'm Cuban, I'm Haitian, I'm Colombia. We're always bringing something to this place with us. That's not like what we left, but not, it's something new to what our surroundings are. What makes the Miami sound as you feel it different from where it would be anywhere else, from New York, from LA, from New Orleans? Like what, what makes that Miami sound very unique to us? It's Caribbean, it's really Caribbean. It's so Caribbean that it's, I mean, no other place in the United States has that Caribbean core like we do. So I know that, you know, LA has a bunch of different influences. I'm not, I'm not saying that they, they got their own thing going on there too, but here is Caribbean music at its core and we're blending it together seamlessly that you don't even know if this is a reggae or is this song or is this this or is it um, uh, un wateke or is it, um, you're just gonna, when you're here you feel that everything is influenced by each other and there's no kind of separation between the two. And I think that, you know, when it, when it, when, when in Cuba, when it happened with the flamenco and the, and, and the Spanish culture with the African culture, it turned into son cubano and nobody said, oh, this is not son cubano, this is not, um, Flamenco, or this is not, it's the same thing with what's going on here. We're blending all the Dominican, uh, Puerto Rican, all the, um, like you said, Haitian, Colombian, all those things are mixing together and becoming seamless. And, and I think that that's what really makes it different than any other place. And I, I love that about that. Well, if you, you know, as it takes form in this opera, um, you know, one of the things that stood out for me, so you set the opera in, I, it maybe scares me to think of it, in a kind of near future where the climate crisis has taken over the city. Do you want to talk a little bit about what your idea was for where this, the setting of this opera? Well, I think when you put the, so it takes place in the year 3050. Mm -hmm. um, dissect that easily, 305 with the zero at the end. I think that, you know, it was easier for me to tell a story about what's going on right now mm -hmm. based in the future, because we're already there. The future is now. I, I think that it's already here. So when I, when I was talking about, um, so a lot of the, the things that are talked about in the show are climate change, how technology is taking over and how it's taking a erasure of identity and, a and taking away from our, our, our culture and making it seem like, oh, this doesn't exist anymore. Um, what, I, what I basically think is that if you base it in, in the future, it's easier to tell that story, mm -hmm. but we're already there, you know? <laughs> I don't know if you get it, but... No, I do get it, because I do think, you know, one of the things that we, we always talk about in our work with the Miami Freedom Project is the climate crisis is... Oh, yeah. It's here now. I think we it's talk here. about it as a very kind of, you know, 30 years. I mean, when I first moved to Miami, it was like, it's 50 years, now it's 30. It's probably, you know, when is it going to be 20? I think every time, you know, we have that, you know, an average, normal rain, and you have that moment where you lose electricity can't get, you know, you have flooding. We, we, we have these kinds of crises. We had an earthquake in New York. These things that shouldn't happen are happening with a frequency that we can't, we've almost normalized it in, in, in a way, but these are very small crises. These are things that are happening right now that we're responding to. And I think when you set this future, there was something, you know, when I realized that you were, you were describing a, a, a future where real, there, there was a real effect to climate that changed the way that we lived. It was in some ways frightening, but then it was also assuring in the sense that I recognize those people. I recognize people who are trying to find a solution, who are trying to find authenticity and truth and beauty and progress and real solutions. So it was almost, it gave me a safe space of being like, it's not now, it's still something that's gonna happen next. But if it were to happen, there are still people who I would understand and could relate to that are trying to figure it out. So it was both. It was a little bit, you know, you got the sense of urgency of these real problems that we're trying to grapple with, mm -hmm. but also a sense of possibility. 
um, that was really powerful for me. So uh, t touching on that, um, the, the opera starts in the year 3050 and everything is underwater and we live in these domes, right? And actually in these domes, ev the, everything is regulated from the air to, to the water, mm -hmm. everything, right? So it, it's not, it's not, you don't even get natural sunlight. And I think that, you know, that may happen soon, but I don't think that that's happening right now. But at the same time, I wanted to create like a warning and, and create, maybe this is what could happen because actually underwater, we won't be affected by the sun as much as under the water, so you could regulate it better. And there's actually a lot of space, outer space in the water. Mm -hmm. So I thought, why don't I make this story under the water instead of above it? Because it's going to be too hot. It's going to be heated. So, but without saying too much about this libretto and about what this is about, and who knows if anybody, when they watch it, will it interpret it like that also. Um, but... I do see us living under the water in the future. Whether whether other people see it or not, I'm, maybe they're already making plans mm -hmm. to have us live in bubbles under the water. You never know. I mean, I, I definitely feel like we're always in a kind of conversation, negotiation with water. <laughs> so when oh, we yeah. think about the sea levels rising, it's, it's taking it's, over. And there is a tension there because it's this thing that you love and then there's a sense that it's coming for you in a way that, that there's this very kind of almost like uneasy tension of like the sense that it's, we're going to be overcome by it. Um, the world is always changing powerful. though with, with the sea levels, with climate, with the ice ages. And it's going to be inevitable that it changes, but we're making it even faster. And who knows if that time is going to come sooner than we think, you know? That's what you, I think. No, I, I, I'm sorry. How do you feel as an artist to comment on a climate crisis, to comment on something that, yes, is this larger change of the world that, we've, that is, is how we evolve and how things change, change, but is also something that we're potentially making worse, that it touches upon a political crisis? How do you feel as an artist commenting on something that can be so polarizing and so difficult for people to even talk about? Because it is frightening. I really don't know why it would be polarizing. We feel it every day, uh, but at the same time, we're we're living it right now. I I I see it as something that we just have to, you know, f face and and learn how to deal with it on a daily basis. And hopefully, the, the leaders and art art itself can help change some minds about where we're going and how how we can make things better. Things in a positive direction. I think that we have time to make things positive. Mm -hmm. Also, I don't want to just think about the gloom because if you just think gloomy, 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 that's what you're going to see around you. But if you think positive thoughts and you and you uh, choose to lead your life in that positive way, it's it'll have that positive mm -hmm. outcome and I think that's also what the opera is about. Yeah, well, look, I think when you're talking about these very difficult ideas or concepts that we don't want to think about, we don't want to think about things changing in a way that's unrecognizable, definitely make it a wall and call. And then it kind of gives you that space yeah. to to enjoy it. It gives you almost oh, yeah. this, there's this, there's this like safe ground space of where it becomes a creative expression, where it becomes something that makes it, it makes it a, it makes it a place you want to be. Um, and I think it's a really important place because it's a place we have to be that you're, you're able to do that. Well, another another point that I... So besides making it so literally about the planet, I think that what happens in this opera is that a lot of things are happening within our own minds. Mm -hmm. And it plays with a lot on perceptions. So it, it in in some ways, it's saying... You know, in my mind, I see Miami like this, and it could become this, but then it could also be like this. And a lot of things just come from the, ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if we project ourselves and, and, and do certain things, it's going to happen. And, and each one of us actually can make a difference. 
the thing is that we, a lot of us don't think that we can make a difference, but we can. Well, I, you know, I, I think there's, you, I, to me, you're so, there's a, there's a real honesty that you apply to, yes, the climate crisis, but then also your own identity as an artist, your own kind of, the things that we all struggle with, yes, in an artistic career, but in all, any path that we've chosen has its conflicts because humans are conflicted. You know, we all have our doubts, we all have our insecurities, and I think you weave those together in a way that does feel very personal um, in your work, and I think beyond the opera, and I think that everyone, I'm excited, I'm so excited to see it, and I'm so, I'm so, grateful that you've, you've created this for us. You know, you also talk about AI in a way that I think is really honest. Um, you know, one of the things that I find so difficult is that we all have, you know, we're, you know we, we struggle with how, how much we use technology when we think of it going beyond what we understand. It's very frightening, yet it's not, it's not stopping and it's happening at a pace. Can you, can you describe for me a little bit why you wanted to make artificial intelligence, the kinds of technology, how we use it, how it's maybe using us too much, how that informs your work or what you want to say through this piece? So one of my favorite lines of this opera, without telling too much, is AI can't take my place. Mm -hmm. So AI is going to happen. It's inevitable. We're going in that direction. But at the same time, us as individuals, us as artists, AI is not going to take our place. We don't have to fear that. We just need to keep on creating and making, making ourselves um, the vehicle that creates those things. But I'm not worried about AI, and I know that AI is going to happen. And I think it's gonna help us because I, I, I really don't think that people should be working so much. Let AI do it. We shouldn't have, I, I like those checkout, self checkout places because it's like, you know what? Let the computer do it. The, people should be doing more fulfilling jobs than that. And I think that many, um, m many people have become slaves to their, to their work you know, and I, I really think, just like in the 1800s when they had the labor rev revolutions, industrial revolutions, there's gonna be another revolution with the AI that actually helps people so they don't do kind of jobs that I think men, they, humans need to relax and enjoy their time on this planet. It's so, such a short time mm -hmm. and we have such a short moment and let AI take care of some things that we, we don't necessarily need to do. You know, I, I think it's a, it's a positive perspective. <laughs> it is. I struggle with it sometimes. You know, I'll give you, like, I will read an article about why you shouldn't read articles right before bed on my phone. Okay. And so you're, you're constantly engaging with the information. See, it's, it's the only way information is coming towards you. And I think we all have that anxiety. And as somebody who's creative, um, I think it's really important to say it's not going to take anything away from me and not be fearful of something that is a, a reality that's going to be changing our experience and how we experience life and always look for ways to be positive. So I think that's wonderful. It is positive. I think people over-exaggerate sometimes on the very negative things that technology can do. But technology has helped us. The thing is that people take things to to like with the phone now, everybody's with the phone. Just put the phone down mm -hmm. and enjoy that moment. There's so many things, there's so many people that all the time recording with the phone. It's like, you know what, just enjoy your moment. There's so many moments that people waste on their phone and it's already AI, you know? So it's like, let, let the technology go. Let yourself go into nature. Look at that mountain, look at that ocean, just take that in and AI won't take your place. But if you let it take your place, it will. Yeah, look, we all have responsibility. We all have to, you know, kind of own our own decisions. So exactly. if you're listening on Miami Community Radio, don't feel like you have to put your phone down. You're doing the right thing. Keep going. But anyone else outside of that, if you feel like it's taking well, your, your, can, your technology and in, in, in kind of intruding on your life, you need to kind of put for, those boundaries They can be out. for an hour on their phone, but they need to know also that there's a world out there to engage in and to to help your neighbors, to be there for your community, to be there for, for your family. 
And a lot of times you get so caught up in the phone. I'm not saying, yeah. uh, please, you got to watch Watch this. Phone. Keep watching. Keep watching. But, but then put your phone down. Um, what is there anything that you're worried about? How do you do you use technology in your music? Are you is it something that you're always looking for new ways to explore it, or do you feel that there's a place where it's just me and my guitar and I don't want to hear anything else? Like, how do you use technology right now as an artist? First of all, technology is everywhere. The wheel is technology. Mm -hmm. So for me, technology is always going to be part of my life, and I embrace it. I don't, I, I would never say, oh, technology is a bad thing. There's beautiful things in technology that have helped humanity from everything from food to the wheel. Um, but uh, when it comes to my own music, yes, technology has been such an aid to me. There's so many tools for to make beats, to make um, music that before we didn't have, uh, uh, even in, in, be, before in the 80s, you would have to pay studios. Now, my studio is in my house. Mm -hmm. I can create whatever crazy stuff I want in my mind so easily, and I could stay up till eight in the morning just creating whatever madness I have in my mind without thinking about studio time, you know? Mm -hmm. So that, to me, is the biggest gift technology has ever given me is just the ability to create and feel free you know nice. you know in this alternate reality that you create in the opera memory and nostalgia plays a big part and I think it's a big part of Miami and the sound and one of the things that I love about your music is that I do hear all the influences of what I love of Cuban music what I love about Caribbean music but it doesn't feel like it's in the past it feels very present And it feels like it's still evolving because so many of us, I think, when we, you know, our memories become an ex our family's memories and they could feel distant from us. Um, and you don't want to think about that experience of being Cuban and, and our music stopping. And I think that's what I think is so powerful about your music, that it feels very present and it feels very alive and it feels like it's evolving. How do you work with memory in, 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 in the opera and how do you work with it in your life? How do, you, how do you bring those influences in a way that doesn't feel limiting but feels like it's what's driving you forward? So when it comes to my roots and to memory, I think that I hold those things so dear to my heart. When I think about my family, all the struggles that they've made just so that I have freedom, I don't take it for granted. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody should. Um, after you know you, your family even did that struggle to go from wherever they were before they went to Cuba, or there's so many stories, right? But we only know or remember maybe to our great grandfathers. It's hard to, to name all of your great grandparents' names you know, which I think is sad because I went to Cuba and I'm like, you don't know You're the grand great-grandmother's name? And a lot of people forget about their past so easily. And, and that's sad to me because I, through this, I'm channeling, through this opera, I channel even my animal ancestors, you know, and I think we come from animals, you know, and I think that so much of us it has evolved through millions of years and we're, we're, we take that for granted. But in the end, you know, I like to, sometimes, I like to say something funny. I'm like, you know, because they're always like, you're a rock star, you're a rock star. I'm like, yeah, but today I feel like stardust. <laughs> you know, because we're, we're rock stars. We all are stars that are just in, inside of us from millions of years of evolution, stars, you know, but we're also dust. We turn into that dust. So I think all of those things, when we think about evolution, those are my ancestors. Memory, mm -hmm. it comes from the stars, you know? So, I mean, I go back, I go back billions of years, you know, in, in, my, in my dreams, in my, in my thoughts, and in this opera, I took myself there, you know, I was like, oh, where am I? What is my roots for real, though? Is it, is it Cuba? I don't, I don't think it's just Cuba. It's not that. It's mm -hmm. so far back that we have kind of no idea, but at the same time, 
if you really meditate on it, you can feel it. Wow. Well, that's <laughs> beautiful. Be beautifully, how you. How, it's beautiful how you can express that and how you can bring that into music. And I, I feel like I feel like we should listen to some of your music now, if we can, Nick. Are oh, we? Okay. Yeah, we okay. So we're good. So do cool. Cool. Not out yet, and it's it's music that's in the opera, so you hear. But it's like, you know, little snippets of it. Enjoy, enjoy. <laughs> Okay, well, I hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, if you didn't, you have to come see the whole opera and you'll get to enjoy even more of it. So thank you for letting us play that and share that. Of course, no, thank you all. Um, you know, I wanted to talk to you about, you know, we, you know, we've talked about this opera. What is it that you're thinking about doing? How do you, how, first of all, how do you get through, how long has this project been going on? How long, how long did it take you to develop this project? Um, all my life. <laughs> all your life. <laughs> but basically, yeah, I think that to make it simple, all my life, uh, literally, I've been working on this music from since 2019. And then to, to conceive the opera as a, as a, as a piece of work um, all together, I think two years. So I'm in the I'm just in the moment with it with it I I don't think about I actually 
funny that it's in the future because I don't think about the future mm -hmm. unless I'm doing something creative. But I, when I'm in my daily life, I'm just in the moment. I don't think about past, present, or anything. I'm just here. And that's the funny thing about time. Mm -hmm. I think that time doesn't exist. And I figured that out last year. And um, that helped me a lot to not judge myself in the past or the present. Just say, I'm here. Well, here is also past. It's per it's future. Mm -hmm. It's time doesn't exist. You didn't ask that, but <laughs> no, I, I I think it's a it's a good it's a good kind of you know, it kind of gives you a sense of like grace of like this you know it's fine it's gonna be okay you don't have to rush to the next thing you can oh you can no. kind of be because I do think there's a kind of time travel ex moment with memory which I think is such an important part of your work where you are experiencing those memories. So when we think about time travel, when we think about past and future, as you're remembering, you're reliving. And I think sometimes we ignore these kinds of very, what we think about miraculous experiences or things that we think of not being able to happen are happening all the time. Oh, yeah. We go other places all the time. We go other places in our minds that feel we're hearing things, we're smelling things, we're sensing things, we're... Oh, yeah moved by things that aren't in front of us. And yet, if I were to tell you that's how I live, you would think that that's, that's not possible. That's, that's absolutely possible. We live that way. Yeah, every time I jump in the pool, I feel like I'm in the Mediterranean. I'm, I, th I, I think I'm in Greece. I'm like, this is not Greece, but I feel like when I'm this in that Greece. water, this is Greece right now. And I'm imagining myself there already after the opera. <laughs> How, how do you feel, how, what is your process for coming through a project that's so, been so all-consuming, that, has, that has, taken its, has, has, has been a big part of your life for a long time, and then you give it up for you know, a couple of days, an audience takes it, they have it now. How do you, how do you come through a project that way, and what, do you, how do you, what is your process for de-escalating or moving into something else or or going on to the next project? What is, how, what is that experience like for you as an artist? Well, first of all, it's just like any, anything, any other big project or anything that is really meaningful to you, it, you don't wanna think too much about mm -hmm. it. You don't, say you're moving to another country or you're moving to another city. Just make, everything is step by step. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not thinking about what happens after, except that I'm doing the show in in January in New York, so I don't think that this is the end of this. I think I, I think it's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm looking forward to doing this a lot more, and this is just the beginning for me. I ha I'm very happy about doing the premiere and getting the reaction and taking this around the world so, or the universe and Mars or wherever they want to do it. I hope so. And do you, <laughs> feel, do you feel like you would want to write another opera or a different opera? I was just talking about that yesterday. Yeah, I, I would, definitely. And, 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 I, and I have some ideas already, yes. Okay. That's exciting. So I'm gonna, I, I gave you some warning, so we have questions from Miami that I think you are going to be, I think in, in some ways you have answered them many times through your work. So don't feel like you have to reference anything or pull anything up. This is just what's hitting you right now in this moment. Oh, okay. This is the, okay. This is a lightning round. You can take as much time as you want. We're good. Gotcha. Okay. So we want to talk about, we always want to know, I think people love, people in Miami love talking about Miami. Um, what it means. So we're going to start on the positive. What do you feel Miami is doing right? Flip flop, chancletas, and croquetas. All right, as as a way of life, something you can have no, every no day, socks. anytime. No socks. No socks. Uh, I, yeah, that's I, yeah. At least right now, I'm feeling that vibe. Yeah, that's what, that's what we do, right? What is Miami doing wrong? What do, what, what do we do wrong? Judging. Judging other people. A lot of people like to do that here. 
I think in general people do that, but Miami, Miami, you know, take it easy on everybody. Yeah. And 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 I'm gonna say, um, road rage. R- road, ha, ha, what what's been your what's your experience? Are you the aggressor? Or are you the receiver of the the aggression? Like how do you how do you deal with road rage? First of all, I'm a cruiser, so mm-hmm. I don't even get involved. I'm I'm just looking from afar, but I see a lot of road rage, and it's kind of you know for me. That's not my vibe. <laughs> it's a lot. I'm a nervous driver, so I feel like whenever the people say things like nobody uses their signal, I feel like I use I overuse the signal. I feel like I am such a cautious person. Whenever I hear anybody complaining about a driver, I just kind of think like, was are they talking about me? Was I there? They'd be like on oh, 995. I think was I on 995 at this time? Like I always think it's me because I feel like I'm the the kind of very careful person that nobody else in Miami is in driving. I'm such a cruiser. Um, when it comes to drive, I've been driving since I'm 15 years old, uh, and I love driving. I've actually, mm-hmm. there's a lot of references in the opera to Mikoete, mm-hmm. um, and the Mikoete is my Mustang. Actually, it's just I love driving. I, I'm, I, I, I lived in Europe, right? When I lived there, what I miss the most is driving. So what, I love driving. What's your favorite road trip? Like, what's your favorite? I'm getting in my car and I'm going here. Uh, out west, I, I love um, I love the mountains too. So I I love that area around the Four Corners and Utah. That area that um, I love New Mexico area. I'm not gonna say I oh I'm getting in my car to go. Mm-hmm. No, I would say I would say if I get in my car to go, it would be more I'm getting in my scooter and going to the beach. That's my everyday thing. But if I'm gonna go for a long one, I'm gonna go probably out west. New Orleans is my other place. I love Texas. I love I love the United States. Nature, the nature here is amazing. There's so many beautiful places that um, that Florida people don't don't go see and I love I love nature what is your what what if you didn't couldn't live in Miami where else would you want to live in the United States uh Virgin Islands really or or Puerto Puerto Rico or or St. Thomas those are my yeah those are my jams right there (laughs) okay so you need some sense of like ocean island oh yeah I don't I'm not going anywhere else to live in anything else that does I, I'm a beach girl, all the way. What is your most nostalgic memory of Miami? When you think of, you know, how sometimes we have we experience that nostalgia in real time. Like you think, like, okay, I'm gonna remember this moment. What's your what's your what's your moment of nostalgia with Miami? I love those uh, Saturday Night Lives and the and the fifth f- uh, over there in South Point Park. I, like you're just mentioning that, I love the those South Point Park um, jams on. I, I I love that. Anything anything that you tell me about nostalgia, I think about Normandy Isle. Mm-hmm. I think about the beach where I grew up. I think about the house that I grew up in, and and how 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 cool it was. Mm-hmm. How cool that time was. You know, I love that. I love that time. What do you miss most about Miami? What do you miss most about that time that you're describing? I don't miss it. I, I, lo- I, I think it's now too. But if I, if you say if I miss it, um, I just miss, I just miss being a kid and not having to pay for stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you know you gotta pay. So everything's really expensive these days over here. So. I know you guys want to move to Miami. It's expensive. It's very expensive. I mean, of <laughs> course, if you grew up with Cuban parents, there was always the, the, the guilt tax. So you didn't pay, but you paid. Like, it was always made clear to you, like, this is what's cost. This is what things cost. I actually didn't have that experience. I, I, I've always been a kid that um, didn't ask for too much. Mm-hmm. I was always given a lot. Um, th- thank God, you know. Thank God for my parents, who were amazing parents. Um, 
that just let me be really creative and and I was always blessed with uh with a lot of great family. You know, I lived a, a great childhood here in Miami besides the you know, crazy Cuban family moments. I love my family, you know, and they they provided, you know. Are you the only musician in your family which is this something that's shared in your family or this was No, I'm not the only to? musician. There. My mom's a music teacher. And uh, my my brother's a musician, and and my sister all w was you know they were all they were all in my family, kind of like um, really into music or musicians. So I think in Cuban families mm -hmm. that's a normal thing. We we have a lot of music in our blood. Mm -hmm. It's part of our culture, like how how. Um, how it is in New Orleans and, and also how it is like in, in Italy, it's the food, but for Cubans, it's the music. Mm -hmm. Es nuestro alimento, you know? So we get, we get nurture, nurtured and nutrient from that. Do you remember a moment where you fell in love with music? Not something that you were just hearing and liking, but something that you felt, I'm gonna, this, this, is, this is how I wanna express myself. Do you have that, any, anything that you can point to or was it just always there? Yeah, it was always there. I, I could say that I've had many mentors from a young age, my parents being included in that, in that, but I, I just, I, I had so much joy uh, in music, um, teachers from the Miami-Dade public school system that inspired me um, to be, to be into music because they, they, they really just, put instruments in my hand from a really young age and they're like, oh, she likes it, let her perform. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> a lot of parties. I was always the singer at every parent party. I was the singer. <laughs> if, if you had to leave Miami, what would you miss the most? Oh, I love my band. I love my, my family and my, my people are here. That's why I don't live in St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. or Puerto Rico, it's because my band is here, my family is here, and, you know, if anything happens, you're there, mm -hmm. and that's important to me, even though, you know, I have, I've lived other places, and I've had that experience, but, you know, when I was, when I was away, my dad got sick for, for a, a moment, I think he had a surgery or something at that time, and I was far away, and I could feel that energy. And, you know, I think just that mm -hmm. experience of me being away and me not being able to be there said, you know what, it's, this is not for me. I'm, mm -hmm. I need to be there. And, and you know, even now when, when I think about if I'm going to move, I always consider having a bigger house than I, than, than I need so that I could have my family too. So I, I'm okay with either one. I, I think I would miss it, but I, I know I'm gonna live somewhere else at some point. Yeah. What would you like Miami to look like in 20 years? Oh, I, I, like, I like it to, to be a, a cultural place that people can come to listen to a lot of amazing music and uh, see a lot of amazing art. Uh, I also think that we're progressing in a great way when it comes to technology here, and 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 I think that that's going to continue. I think that you know they're all the leaders really want these these kinds of um, electric car companies and be a base for technology would be amazing to me. And I think that we're forward thinking people. Mm -hmm. And it would be nice to see see it progress not only in the technology way but also in the arts. Mm -hmm. That would be what I would like, and and make sure the beach is clean. Yeah. Um, what I, this is? We usually have an extra credit question, which I feel I can't give you because it's if Miami was a novel, what would the plot be? And I feel like you've written a full plot. <laughs> It's your opera, mm -hmm. and it, it would be unfair to just spring this one on you and be like, do, do a second one. Do another one right now for me. But um, I do think that your, your opera is, is a real, 
you know, I think this is, it, 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 it can be oversaid, but I, I, I think it's a, it's a real, it's beautiful the way that you see Miami. Um, even if you're setting it in the future, I think it's a Miami that we all recognize or we all can recognize and we'll, we'll be able to recognize through your music and through the experience of being um, in this opera and having this artistic, creative experience with so many beautiful collaborators and artists that feel the same connection to Miami that we do. So I think you've already given us that. So thank you for that. Positive Vibration Nation. Miami Light Project, um, April 12th and 13th. And is there anything else that we need to share with people about being able to see the show and being able to, to experience this opera? I think, I think that, you know, just love one another. That's the most important. All right, well, thank you so much, Sol. We love having you here, and thank you so much for giving us this time. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you, thank you for watching and tuning in. I hope to see you guys there, and it's been such a pleasure. Thank you, and if when you need to shut off, you can shut off now, <laughs> or no, keep watching. But still, it's just just know that 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 choice is yours. So thank you, everyone. <laughs>